It was the first bloom that allowed the Arab Spring to blossom. Yet Tunisia's democratic reforms have led to protests again and questions about whether newly won freedoms are withering. This is Roundtable with me, David Foster. democracy born of the Arab Spring uprisings, but there are Tunisians who say the country has failed to get any better since Ben Ali was ousted in 2011. A deal to get a loan from the International Monetary Fund has seen prices go up and taxes too. Unemployment is a problem and the economy is weak. Once again, there have been protests on the streets of Tunisia. Seven years after the 2011 revolution, and nine governments later, people are protesting about austerity measures, after a new budget was announced, raising taxes and the cost of living. Where others have failed, Tunisia has successfully held on to democracy in the wake of its revolution. But can it boost a flagging economy and bring about a return to prosperity? Since Tunisia's dictator Zini al Abidine Ben Ali was ousted seven years ago, food prices have risen on average by 8% each year, and the dinar continues to depreciate. <laughs> In 2016, international lenders approved a $2.9 billion load to Tunisia. But last year, that lifeline was frozen and the government responded with more austerity. And it is that that has pushed hundreds of people over the edge. Protests that began peacefully soon turned violent. <laughs> More than a dozen government buildings have been set on fire and more than 800 people have been arrested. As matters escalated, one protester was killed. The anger grew. In an effort to bring calm, the government promised social reform with plans to increase aid to the poor by $70 million. Protesters say these reforms won't go far enough. Tunisia is considered the success story of the Arab Spring but seven years after the Jasmine Revolution, several governments have struggled to breathe life into the economy, and the Tunisian people's frustration at a lack of economic progress is coming to the fore. Very pleased to say that joining us via Skype from Tunis is Maresia Labidi, a member of Tunisia's parliament representing the Anakta party. Also in Tunis, the journalist Simon Speakman Cordell, here with me at the round table, Sami Hamdi, the editor in chief of the International Interest and Online Current Affairs Analysis magazine, and Claire Spencer, a senior research fellow for the Middle East and North Africa program at Chatham House. Thank you very much indeed, all of you, for taking the time to do this. Uh, Meretzia, can I ask you bluntly what you think has gone wrong? Ah, what is going wrong? Um, I think that uh, so far, Politicians in Tunisia, from, let's say, governing coalition and opposition, have not found, uh, let's say, uh, the way to, to dialogue and to put in common their vision for economy, how to uh, improve Tunisian economy, how to provide um, uh, uh, employment uh, for youth, how to really bring development to Tunisian uh, uh, citizens. 
And I think this is not uh, only uh, the responsibility of, let's say, Tunisian politicians, but uh, even the international community. So far, they have given us a uh, lot of uh, good words and yeah. encouragement, and you are exception, etc. But as um, in terms of economic help, economic support and investment, no, I think are okay. not as expected. Well, let, let me put this to, to Sami here. Um, Maritz is effectively saying that the people of Tunisia have been let down, but why have they been let down? I think part of it is right, and, 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 and I think if we focus just on that, it would be a great exaggeration. What I agree with is that the Tunisians have been let down. The problem is the market is held ransom, first of all, by Europe with regards to the tourism sector because of a rise of a more mm. cautious Europe towards Tunisia, all these different travel advices against visiting well, Tunisia. Well, people don't want to go like, there because they, they fear they might get shot. But there have been other, other shootings in other countries, and uh, there, haven't, there hasn't been the same Well, Egypt uh, was response. hit when there were shootings there. But people are now still going to Sharm el -Sheikh. But yeah. what I'm saying is the second strand of the market being we held to ransom many, uh, is, is, is the IMF loan, is the crippling austerity that's being imposed uh, on Tunisia. The reason why I say it's not the whole problem, however, is because domestically what I feel is going on with Tunisia is this romanticization of the revolution, this desire from everybody to say Tunisia was a great example of a successful transition, and the wool is finally coming off the eyes. It was never so. It had to be so because Tunisia is in a region where we've seen a military coup against a democratically elected president in Egypt. We've seen Libya and Syria fall into a civil war. It made no sense to apply the same scrutiny to Tunisia. Let's take example 2011. Nahda, which won the first, uh, first place in the elections, Maurizio's party, refused to mm -hmm. acknowledge refused to acknowledge the third largest party in the victory. Hamad Ishbel al Jazeera at the time said, who became the Prime Minister for Nahda, we will not negotiate with this party. Immediately there was a rejection of the democratic will of the likes of Sidi Bouzid, of Gasrin, of these central areas. I'm going to stop you there because we could go on in the mm. detail for a very long time. I'll bring, bring Claire in here to get a little bit of an overview because one of the things that Sammy seemed to say was yeah everybody sort of said how fantastic it was to have a mm. revolution but mm. was it a sudden realization that you know now we've got to do something and nobody really had a clue what to do well I think while so much emphasis was on the politics there was very little mm. emphasis on what kind of economy uh, Tunisia wanted to be and I remember I was there as a, an observer of the first elections in November 2011 and even then, there were parties. There was a whole array of parties who could stand in fairness. In fact, there were too many parties at that time um, who were putting forward ideas about linking the coastal economy to the interior. It was that realization that while before the uprisings, the revolution in 2011, Tunisia had been seen as a very homogenous, smallish, buoyant state. And most Tunisians are still coming to terms with the fact that there are deep social cleavages between the rich and poor. You see demonstrations. Everyone says the coastal economy is rich and it's the interior and the south like Gafsa, yeah. uh, Kassarin, etc., which are poor. But in fact, you have neighborhoods in, uh, in the outskirts of Tunis, which I was shocked to see when I was uh, an election observer, who were very much uh, poverty stricken. And I think the central political establishment has struggled uh, to actually engage with the rest of the population. And one reason for this is that the delay, it seems to me, in local elections. There have been no local elections since 2011, and we need to know what and who is representing so, people so, outside. So, Simon, we're going to come to you as, as a journalist in, in Tunisia, um, specifically in Tunis itself. You've observed these protests. Do you, do you sense that they are going to be very short-lived, or is there an underlying... Uh, feeling that something needs to be said for things to change? Um, I think that's an excellent question. Um, certainly these protests aren't taking place in isolation. Um, the price rises have sparked them, that's true. But they really need to be seen as a continuation of the resistance to the things like the reconciliation law and the security law that's mm. suggested to come in later on this year. I don't say that lightly. Um, they're the same people. Um, the main organizers of the Anti-Reconciliation Act, Manish Massama, are the same people, well, give or take a couple, of Feshnas Tenyu. Um, somebody's going to correct me the way I say that. Uh, what are we waiting for? The organization that's resisting the current price rises. So there is this growing 
strata of discontent. Um, it's educated um, and fairly middle class in Tunis. It's angry, it's unemployed and also educated out in the interior. They're both protesting against the same thing, but I think for quite different reasons. But, I mean, does it have a, a bearing on what happened in 2011 when there, there were street protests uh, born out of a frustration uh, with authority, initially the street vendor who, you know, found he couldn't make his living and set himself on fire. Uh, do, you, do you sense that there is something similar, or are we looking at something very different? Because you can bring about a revolution against a dictator, but once you've got a democracy to an extent, you, it's difficult to see what you're fighting against. I agree. I'm not entirely sure if people really know what they want. I mean, what we're seeing is a structured but large-scale expression of rage. Um, Yusuf Shah had Beji Kaida Sebsi a very hard to get angry at. They're not the big bad in the same way that Ben Ali was. So what we're really looking for is reform. And I think what we're really looking for, what the protesters are supposed to do, is that their demands are recognized and engaged with, which they, I don't think they really have been um, with this aid program. Okay. Maurizio, I'm going to come to you, and then, then you know, it's, it's up to anybody else to jump in with any opinions that they have. And you can talk to one another, of course, here. What needs to be done to fix this? Because it seems like there has been a inertia, for a start, uh, petty grumblings between the parties, and the people of Tunisia, by and large, have been forgotten. Um... I don't uh, think that it is inertia, but uh, I think that uh, uh, we have uh, uh, lots of, uh, first of all, uh, the legacy is heavy. The legacy of the past of left by the year, decades and decades of dictatorship is heavy. We have really problems are structural problems in, in employment, in uh, administration, and in even in poverty. So the task is tremendous. And I shall say that uh, polit uh, political parties in general shall uh, show more sense of responsibility. The issue now is not only who govern, but why, why to govern. And uh, for example, my party was against delaying and delaying local elections. Local election can answer this some uh, uh, expectations. But, of you, but you have power citizens. in government as well, don't you? Your party. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, they are the partners yes. in the government. We are partners. So, so, yes, so why, if there are delays, and aren't you doing something to sort it out? Uh, after the crisis in uh, the instance um, of supervi supervising elections, and uh, many parties, both in coalition and in opposition, we're not that enthusiastic to the election. And you know, a successful election is not an election led or entered by only one party. And uh, we've done our maximum to settle the crisis of the uh, election uh, high authority. And then now the election is set for May. And we are doing our best to have this election because advancing in um, let's say local power yeah. br will bring answers to needy families. Okay, well, let me, let me ask Sammy, and he may and want to ask you so, a question yes. about this as well. Is, is that going yes. to be Welcome satisfying family. for the... Whoops, excuse David, me, the people of Tunisia. David, let's, let, let's talk with, 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 with brutal honesty about what's going on in Tunisia in the first place. Why nobody has been able to deal with the economic situation? Because Nahda has been in survival mode because it's worried that what happened in Egypt would have happened in Tunisia. So it entered into coalition to protect itself. Beji Qaida Sibsi has his son vying to become president and therefore the party is splitting over this succession struggle to the extent to which Mohsen Merzouk has left the party and formed his own party. What the evidence of this is, there is so much political feuding, and also remember, Tunisia is life and death situation. It's not like Labour Party leaves government and Conservative Party comes in. Nahva feel that if there's a return of the former regime, they go back to the prison cells. They're in survival mode. The fear they had over what happened in Egypt was such that they could not focus on the, on the economy or focus on any of these particular issues. Rashid Ghanoushi went straight into not survival really. mode. Berge really. Sibsi, no, half no, of Qaeda Sibsi, really. half of Qaeda Sibsi is desperate to become president. He is, Hadi Bakush is against it. Mohsen Merzoug is against it. The other members of the Nidea okay, party so, so, are so against it. So turmoil, turmoil. The party is paralyzed. Okay. Yes. Nobody is focusing is this, is this, on the economy. No, can, can, I, can I answer Sammy? Yes, yes, please, can I please answer do. Sammy? Please do. Okay. Right, so do come in and then, then we'll Sammy, bring Claire I respect in. Your, I respect your point of view, but this is not 
true. All is relative. Yes, indeed, uh, the, what happened in Egypt impacted not only Nahda, but all Tunisia. But you know, what we are doing for political stability in Tunisia is, first of all, targeting economic growth. How can you bring back security? How can you bring back investors? How can you speak of development and economy if politically the country is not stable? But, uh, what we have Hesia, done, it's we'll not out of fear no, no, for Sammy, ourselves. I've, I've got to it's give clarity. Out of fear of here, our cause... It's out of concern of starting economic, real world. You'll work be able to come back in, in in just a moment. This is my please. answer. And in okay, order we have two Tunisians here from... arguing. Let, let's get an overview. <laughs> From Claire Spencer, is, is, I is think, this the way you see it? I think there's elements of truth in that. Destroying a country. Well, there's always political infighting, and I don't think uh, we sitting in Europe or the UK can actually uh, dictate to others how politicians behave. But what they do have a responsibility for, and they've had, you know, six, seven years now to get a grip mm -hmm. on understanding the dynamics of the economy understanding that their palliative solutions and all governments, whether it's another or the coalition at the moment, have created more public sector jobs. It's now a fifth of the workforce is paid for. And this is one of the reasons there's a public sector deficit of 6% is that all these salaries have to be paid. There have been people, and I know some of them in the university system, uh, in a new type of digital focused private sector saying we need to reshape the way Tunisians interact with the global economy. And I wonder how many people in the political circles who were arguing over power, here I agree with, with Sami, actually have any understanding of how to design, leave alone, deliver. So let, let's, go, let's go program. to this massive loan from the International Monetary Fund that uh, if you were suffering on the streets of Tunisia, if you were yeah. just reading the newspapers or listening to the news, you'd think two and a half billion dollars coming in. Well, that's going to be fantastic. All the problems are going to be solved. So. A, that's sort of unreasonable to think that, but it's natural. Mm. But what went wrong? I think it's the capacity to put this money to work in a viable and vibrant private sector. What you have is very strong vested interests within the private sector. One of the complaints, I think, of those out in the streets protesting, as Simon has alluded to, is the fact that a lot of things that should have been addressed by now, like corruption, like transitional justice, like sorting out the good and the bad from the Ben Ali era, I think there's a suspicion that quite a few people from the, I'm not going to name names, but people from the Ben Ali era yeah. have yeah. not been put through justice, that they're actually, there's an elite uh, who are running sectors of the private. So they're creaming off some of this money? Yes, and even people who are representing, you know, the, the, the work, sorry, the, um, the business confederation have vested interests to protect. What you also have is very high graduate unemployment. 30% of graduates are unemployed. Now, is it because they are unemployable because their degrees aren't worth anything? Or could they be retrained actually to set up and start up small and medium enterprises? We which need was, time to retrain them. Yep. We need time to retrain them. Uh, absolutely. Yes. But this was I the message, think. if you yeah. remember, right back in 2012. Mm -hmm. I remember in the, you know, the EU was promising at the Deauville summit large investment into Tunisia. And I think the key problem is um, it seems international agencies are stuck for where do they put the money but, where it's going to be productive. But then the IMF puts the squeeze on Tunisia, it seems to me iniquitous. Crippling austerity measures. Well, the government could have negotiated something better. They could have said, OK, here's, you know, austerity is going to have the effect it's had. And they are probably going back to the IMF arguing exactly that now. But in order to be credible, late, well, to be credible, well, I think it is late because this has been known, as I say, since 2011. These things were talked about. What kind of economy? How do we build the infrastructure to link the neglected interior um, provinces of Tunisia with the coast? None of that has been implemented. I would suggest not just because, and I agree, the international agencies have to make sure their money is accounted for, but nobody has had a coherent plan as to how this will happen internally. And there everybody, is money in Tunisia which is not being spent. Everybody on. wants to jump in here, but Simon's been sitting there quietly uh, for some time, so I think it's only fair, fair to ask you this. The, the question of tourism was raised by Sami. It, 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 it's, it's a lifeblood, if you like, of the Tunisian economy, if it's working well. Do you see... A, a return to the Tunisian beaches, or is there still an awful lot of concern about security? I think people um, will come back, maybe not in the numbers that we saw um, before Seuss. Um, but I think it's important to remember, I interviewed not 
a great deal of time ago, um, somebody from the African Development Bank, who was telling me that in 2010, um, structurally, uh, tourism was actually making a loss for Tunisia. I mean, mm. that's not to say there wasn't a lot of revenue, a lot of people were unemployed, but the bottom line, it was losing money. Um, and that hasn't changed really since the revolution. Um, Tunisia is home to this spectacular natural heritage. But in terms of tourism, it continues to compete just in terms of price and these resorts. Mm -hmm. People haven't been able to come to these resorts now for two years. Trends move on. There is a call that will return, but I think the tourism market is older now and perhaps less willing um, to return to something when they're not guaranteed. Where do you think, the... Simon, your next headline is going to come from? In Tunisia? Yeah. I hope it's the municipal elections. I really do. Hmm. Um, under the constitution, this is going to be a major shift um, in power from Tunis to the regions. The regions will become a lot more responsive. OK, let, let's, let's talk about... That shift is also the danger. Let, yeah, let's talk about the succession, because we have an extremely elderly president, an awful lot of people still see a hangover from the Ben Ali times. Where does Tunisia need to go in terms of making itself a modern democracy? Sammy, let me ask you that first, and Maretz, you can come back in in just a minute. Well, let's try to start off with a basic democracy where votes aren't bought, where uh, we, have, we don't have political tourism where an MP can suddenly say, you know what, I don't like Nahda, I'm going to go to Nida. And in Parliament, he can simply do that. This is why I say when, when, when Meher Zia, uh, and she's a key part of, of the transitional justice, and as a Tunisian, we thank her for her service uh, during this particular period. But the key thing is this. When in 2012, 2013, there was a crisis, there were mass MPs moving from one party to another in Parliament. Mass, they were being bought by Bahri Jlasi, by Salim Riyahi, by all of these various different businessmen. Nahva, because it had a political agenda, because it didn't like a particular rival party, sat back and abstained from a vote brought in Parliament, which said that they cannot be, that we will not vote against political tourism. In other words, they had the chance to secure political stability, and they didn't. Sipsi, the Nida Tunis, they had a chance to help with transitional justice to bring people to account. Instead, they pushed the National Financial Reconciliation Law, which pardons every financial crime prior to 2011. Why? Because they said they needed that money for investment. Where did that money go? If Tunisia is an unstable economy, are businessmen going to keep their money there? No, they're not. Shout they took the money and they moved it out. They moved it out to the Switzerland. They moved it out to Europe. Okay. This is the reality mm. of what happened. So neither party was after political stability here. <coughs> We're running out of time. So I want to get Chatham I House's over. job is to I take a well, so take a, take a long look. view. Well, the first yeah. thing to say about this inter internet, the, sorry, the financial uh, crimes law is actually due to street process, which were very focused. It actually excluded from in the impunity implied within it the business community. It's it's only the the only ones with impunity are public officials who it's understood were Which, forced. Now that to. again also caused some anger, didn't it? Well, of course it did, but it's better than allowing the big fat cats that you've been talking about, Sammy. You know the the big business who are now to, public to officials. actually be. Yes, but some of them, you know, the system so needs to bring well, them we're, we're to account. Here, we're from here. Succession, I think, you know, ironically, uh, the Tunisians need to take a leaf out of the French book and actually get somebody much younger, like Macron, uh, not Macron necessarily in terms of his politics, but in terms of age profile, in terms of somebody who actually represents what is now the bulk of the population, okay. Maretia, who are under 30. Maretia, is there that sort of person around, somebody to, to lead the youth of Tunisia and to sort of take it into the middle of the 20th? 21st century with hope? Uh, I think uh, that Tunisian first of all, the youth has to be more rep represented within the government, the executive power, and also especially on, you know, on these coming local elections, because uh, we need their ideas, we, ne we need their vision of the world. But I, I think that our leaders now also they are guaranteeing uh, 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 how I can say uh, some understanding but and perhaps they're looking after themselves that our, no not really this is it's easy to uh, to accuse it's easy to accuse but uh, uh, in many uh, opportunities uh, the president of the Republic has shown that uh, stability in Tunisia, peace in Tunisia, uh, fighting terrorism in Tunisia, and also 
bringing uh, investors in Tunisia is his priority. And so did uh, the, the president of my party. We are not going just to reject this generation. But as parliamentarian, as woman, I'm always saying in the say parliament, we need to make place more place for the youth. Okay. And our uh, chief of government is a young man. He's a, like a And your president's 92. <laughs> um, thank you very much indeed. Um, listen, I'm going to have to say goodbye to all of you and thank you for, for your time. It, it always goes very, very quickly and we, we don't get round to every single point I, I would like to cover. But Tunisia, a, a country of immense uh, natural resources, w wonderful talent in the country too. And, and as we saw, immense bravery uh, going back to 2011. It is tottering a little bit at the moment. We've examined some of the problems. We've looked at some of the possible solutions. We shall wait to see what happens with this next round of elections. You've been watching Roundtable with me, David Foster. And from all of our guests, thank you for watching. Hope to see you next time. Bye-bye.